All right, folks. So welcome to the Taking the Lid Off podcast. Uh, I want to read you a quote real quick. Um, And that is, give me a lever long enough and a fulcrum on which to place it, and I shall move the world. And that's a quote from Archimedes, which is part of our book called Leadership in Balance, which is our guest today, Mike Lariel, one of my former battalion commanders. We're going to talk about leadership and talk about his book. And I'm excited. So welcome, Mike. It's good to have you. Glad to be here. Really, really a pleasure, Chad. So just tell us, let's get started about the, the listeners and viewers a little bit about you. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm a, a native of Maryland, but I don't ever plan on moving back there. I grew up in the suburbs uh, outside of Washington, D.C. Uh, went off to the military academy when I was 18 and, and never really looked back. Um, it was a great place to grow up, but it's just it wasn't, you know, nothing that draws me back there. My folks don't live there anymore there. Uh, I've got one of my siblings there. I, I love where the Army has sent me. Uh, for 23 years, I was on active duty as an infantry officer. Uh, about half that time spent here at Fort Bragg, which is where I live right now. Uh, when I retired in 2006, our youngest was still in high school, so we decided to stay. And um, yeah, uh, for 40 years now, I've been kind of uh, studying and practicing leadership, working with the Army still, working with soldiers still. It's been kind of cool. Yeah, great, great. So, so Mike and I were together in the 82nd, 2505, uh, good old Two Panther. So hopefully we get a lot of Two Panther listeners to uh, hear this yeah, and reminisce a little bit. That's right. Um, but those are great days. And, you know, one thing I enjoyed about you, Mike, as a commander is that you always had great hair. And, uh, you know, I that's something you look for in a command. No. Uh, but I was... I was never known for uh, towing the line with the uh, the typical short haircut, and uh, so I saw this guy and I'm like, okay, all right, like I, I like it. <laughs> it was a flat top back then until we deployed to Afghanistan, and then I can't remember who was cutting my hair, but uh, I was kind of looking around to see whose whose hair didn't look too badly damaged or dinged up. You know, nobody found the guys who didn't have any blood coming off of their scalp, and I'm like, who cut your hair? And that became my guy that cut my hair. So, yeah. Yeah, so if you're unfamiliar, I guess I should say in Airborne Division and whatnot, the military period, you got to have good haircuts. And in the 82nd, you know, every Sunday or every weekend, whatever, you're getting a haircut. So you got a fresh haircut, got to look good. Yeah. Uh, and quite honestly, that was never my thing. Uh, matter of fact, I don't, you've probably never heard this story, but I was my squad was once called the Brad Pitt Squad uh, <laughs> by a certain – command sergeant major from first brigade at the time while we were deployed to iraq and uh we we maybe didn't weren't getting the best haircuts while we were in iraq but i mean hey we were deployed and uh yeah he was not too happy and called us the brad pitt squad so interesting That's yeah awesome yeah that was interesting <laughs> times I, there's probably more i could say about all that but i'll leave it at that yeah yeah it's uh it's interesting i mean i i you know, you, you, there's great things about the 82nd and there's some terrible things about the 82nd and, uh, but you live and learn, you know, uh, I think one of the yeah. best things I've seen is more and more, uh, the army sending people to different units to kind of see and learn, um, you know, Chris Lewis, I don't know if you remember him or not from the mortars. He was, he's a great example of that, yeah. you know, to tell you the broadening his horizons to go to different places and, um, is, yeah, the, the 82nd seconds a great, great place. But if, you, if it's the only thing you've ever done, the only thing you, you, you know, uh, that can be pretty uh, stifling, incestuous. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, so, so we're, so we're going to talk about leadership today some, and that, and that's a good example. You know, that was a case where we had this Sergeant Major come in and he was not happy with us. And uh, he had a lot of, he, he basically came to our, Ford operating base in Iraq, uh, bitched at us for lack of a better term and left. Um, yeah. You know, and yeah. this was after you, right? Cause this was Iraq. Yeah. Um, and so that would have been, you had, you had gone already. Um, but yeah, that was a good old, I'll leave his name off, but, uh, command sergeant major for the brigade of first brigade at the time. And, uh, I'll never forget. He came to our tent 
looked at a table we had, which we had been eating MREs off of, cleaning weapons off of, and it had some writing from the previous unit, nothing vulgar. But uh, he he more or less yelled at us about this table. Why didn't we clean it up? And I, I didn't even know what he meant. I, I was dumbfounded, honestly. I was thinking, okay. Yeah. Uh, and then he went to our haircuts, and that's where the Brad Pitt thing came from. So interesting style of leadership. Yeah, it's funny. I just started reading uh, How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. You know, a classic. It right. was originally first written in the 30s, right? Updated, right. but... Um, and one of the things they are, they're constantly, he's constantly driving on there is the need to appreciate people, to acknowledge them, to not flatter them, but give them sincere, uh, appreciative feedback. And all the stuff I do in coaching and all the stuff, the research, you know, and feed, giving people feedback, it's like, you know, those nuggets of telling people that they're doing a good job, right? And it's that, you know, um, people crave that, right? And, and when you just yell at people or bitch at people, it serves no purpose other than to make the person who's, who's doing the bitching feel like they're important, I think, right? And right. so, uh, you, you know, just walking past two groups of people, right? If they're screwing up, you know someone's going to say something. But if they're doing a good job, people often just walk by and they're just like, well, they're just doing what they're supposed to be doing. When, you know, real leadership, sincere leadership would take the time to go, hey, good job. You know, I, you guys are clearly putting your your some effort into this, and and uh, I don't know. They're the best leaders I ever worked for were the guys that you know took the time to let you know they appreciated you and what you were doing. The the if it looks good, it is good mentality. A lot of the older guys in the 82nd, um, that was never my thing. Um, right. Yeah. So. Yeah, and and I agree. My uh, that was something that I never bought into. I was never that way. Um, I never got that way. I saw it, didn't like it. Um, and that's kind of, I'm working on a leadership book as well. Have been forever, seems like, but, uh, that's kind of going to be a lot of my angle. There is the leadership that I saw and how I learned from them. And there's going to be stories like that in there. Yeah. Uh, you know, not, not going to try to be too negative. Obviously you don't want ever want to be that. So I have a lot of positive stories as well, but, um, yeah, some of those experiences you live and you learn from them. That's right. <laughs> yep. Um, yep. But yeah, so so you've got a so you've got a book, um, so you got your book out here, Leadership and Balance, uh, which I showed a while ago. So just give us a brief and tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so the Leadership and Balance was the book that I was thinking about for ten years. You know, from when I retired. I mean, I was thinking about it before I retired, but from the time from the day I retired until the day I actually sat down to to get serious about writing, it was about ten years. And, um, you know, it was, it, I just was trying to think about the things I could say about the basics of leadership. You know, what would I say to people who, um, and I never intended it to have a military audience. So my, my intention was always, you know, people who didn't have the benefit of a military career or time in the military. What would I say to them about leadership and the essentials of leadership? Because at the time, in that 10-year period, I spent a lot of time working with scientists and engineers and researchers on some of the projects and incredibly smart people, but, you know, incredibly inept at, at leading teams. And so they were kind of my focus group as I was writing the book. But um, it's basically, you know, I take the four, what I consider the four central domains of leadership, define them, break them down and talk about how the key to success in leadership is knowing your natural tendency in each of these four domains, communication, adaptability, focus and influence. And then understand, be situationally aware enough to understand what's going on in the situation so that when um, things are out of balance, uh, it's generally because the way you want to lead in that domain is not the way the situation demands of you to lead. And so, know your, so again, first two parts, know your natural tendency for that domain, know what the situation demands of you, and when it's out of balance, the two things aren't the same, be the fulcrum right? Be the point on which balance is regained. Um, and the first book is about in the individual skills of the leader. So it's more about balance. The book I'm working on right now is balance and leverage. So that Archimedes uh, quotation comes in there a little bit more uh, for this next, the way I'm looking at it for the next go around. That's essentially it. Know, know your natural tendency in four domains. Know when the situation demands something different from you and uh, be the fulcrum. 
simple. Got it. Yeah. And it's a great book. Uh, I didn't read it until recently when I decided I was going to do this because I think <laughs> when we, when I, when I got the book from you, I, t I told you I was also going to work on a leadership book and I didn't want to read yours because in yeah. my mind, I was like, I, I want to have my thoughts be pure. I've yeah, already I got it. the majority of those thoughts captured. So yeah. I was like, man, I got to get in and dig into this thing. And, and I, and I love it. Um, Thanks. And I think it's, it's, there's nothing new necessarily in leadership, right? I mean, it is what it is. Uh, we just present it different ways and all. And I think the book does a really good job of presenting it that people can, uh, can digest. Um, but so, so you do, so you do some traveling and, and speaking with folks as well, using this, this book as well and what you write about in the book, right? Yeah. And how's that? Yeah, been I do. Um, it, you know, I mean, it's going well. I, I've, uh, you know, I'm, I'm probably up to uh, eight clients right now that uh, I touch at least once a year. Um, some I'm, I'm, I've got one that is going now from a quarter to probably once a month uh, because of an expansion and a merger that happened there. And uh, through word of mouth, you know, other, other people that work within that sphere, um, I've had uh, people approach me this year to to take them on as clients, so it's good. I, I we were talking earlier, you know, I've I've had this idea that uh, I want to expand and double my client base every year, and so uh, I'm I'm pretty much tracking, but uh, I'm getting to the point where next year, if I had to double it, would be a pretty big jump. I'm pretty happy. It's I'm, I'm making a good living doing it, but more important than anything, I'm having a, I'm having a great time. I love what I'm doing. And the opportunity to help people and uh, let them see what's possible, you know, when they just focus a little bit more on leadership, uh, it's pretty cool. My, my longest and biggest client, um, the year I started working with them was probably one of their worst years in terms of uh, sales and revenue. And the last two years, they've been knocking it out of the park, absolutely crushing it. Awesome. And I can't, yeah, I mean, I, and I can't say I don't have the the metrics or the data to go. Yep, I did that. Your revenues, uh, I can show that what I did with you increased revenues this much, profit this much. Um, but their but their sense of it is, you know, I mean, and probably more important than as much as I'd like to be able to have the data to say it. Um, their sense of it is that it's had an impact, a positive impact on them. If nothing else, I get to feel good about that, that I've got a satisfied customer, um, satisfied client. Uh, but for me, I just to watch them, to see where they are now from where they were three years ago. Uh, it's, it's amazing. And, and, you know, these are people who, I mean, talk about not having a military background. Um, right. You know, not even close. And, but they just, they're like sponges and every every bit of help that you can give them, right? Um, they just, they love it. And so for me, it's been, it's been just an amazing, an amazing run, a great, uh, great reward. So. Yeah. So is there something when you're speaking to civilians and you're talking about military leadership and, and all, is there something that you usually say that captures them that they go, Whoa, wait a minute. Um, well, from my own book, I think one of the, the key things is the selfish versus selfish, selfless versus selfish uh, components of focus. I think they're all like, you know, oh, military, it's all about selfless service. And, and it is. I mean, but um, what we have to recognize in and out of the military is that uh, we need to pursue our own, uh, our own goals, our own desires. Right. Not in a way that right. is contrary to the group or contrary to uh, the larger organization. But if we're not doing what we love and what we want to do, we'll never be our best, right? And so that's a balancing between the selfish and the selfless. So I think that's something they weren't expecting to hear from a military guy. Um, on the, the other thing I think that they probably pick up on the most is just, you know, the discipline kind of things, the structured kind of things that we did in the military. I'll give you an example. After action reviews, you know, I mean, we did after action reviews right. all the time. It's second nature, right? And and probably in some units to the point where they take it for granted or they're just kind of going through the motions, right? Because, oh, we got to do the after action review. But the good units take the time 
to really digest and diagnose the success and failure of whatever it was they just did, right? How did they succeed? How did they fail? How did they do better the next time and, and mitigate failure and, and uh, exploit success? Civilian companies, by and large, don't do that. I mean, they're, they're just on this so busy, right? You know, it's like, it's just, if we went well, high five out the door, you know, don't even care about how it happened. We just did well. Um, and if it did poorly, then they're going to do it, but probably more about figuring out who's to blame, right? Right. And so j just getting them to do things like an after action review, it's incredible um, the, the difference that that makes uh, yeah. in some of these organizations. So. Yeah, no, that's, that's awesome. So for me, I, when I was, I, cause I've done some, uh, some speaking about leadership with groups and, and I love doing it and the, something that captures them right away, me speaking more from the, the NCO, the non-commissioned officer perspective, talking about, um, you know, I'll, I'll typically ask people, you know, how many of you have kids and do any of you work with your kids? Cause as a young leader in a, the infantry, like we were together, that's kind of what it's like, because not only am I making sure your room is clean, your barracks room and, you know, your, your uniform for the day is straight and all that, but I'm also teaching you to shoot, move and communicate. Right. Um, so it's a, it's a huge responsibility. And when you kind of lean in with them on that, their, their eyes get big and they really, like you said, become sponges and, um, start really dialing in because I don't think, I don't know what I'm getting as civilians understand the level or depth of leadership, as I like to say, um, that we have in the military. Um, yeah. It's just different. I mean, it's different. It's, you know, it's your manager at Lowe's, God bless them all, is is not, doesn't have the same level of responsibility as maybe what you would consider a manager in the military. Right. And I think, you know, that it's interesting, Chad, because that's, that's the term probably where the distinction is made. Management and leadership are two separate things, right? Right. Um, and, and, but you have to do, be able to do both. To be, right. to be effective, you have to be able to manage, right? And I, and I draw it out when I'm working with people. It's like, you know, it's you manage stuff, you lead people. You manage processes, you lead to get an outcome. Um, you, you manage to mitigate risk, you lead to accept risk, right? And so they're, they're different, but you got to be able to do both because it's not just like this list. It, it's a Venn diagram. They overlap, right? And that place where they overlap is the sweet spot. That's where real leadership happens. You know, so like with my civilian clients, I'm like, you know, you manage your workflow. You manage the, the roster of who's coming in today because payroll is going to be one of the biggest drains on your uh, profit and loss sheet, right? The, if you've got too many people working, you're losing money. If you don't have enough people working, you're not making the sales, right? So finding that is the, is that's management, right? But you're, but there's people on the other end of that, right? And yeah. so if you keep giving the same person all the nights and weekend shifts, you're failing at leadership, right? Because now you've got this person who's just become disgruntled. You know, they could become the, the really disgruntled insider who robs you blind by stealing stuff out of your stock room, right? Or stealing, right. you know, stealing uh, proprietary information off of your, your uh, shared drives or, or things that no one else should have access to. Because you failed in leadership, because you were managing the process, but you weren't leading the people that were a part of that process. And so um, I think that's where they, they lose it, right? Because in the military, we put the leadership up front, right? The focus on the people that help you get to the mission. Um, that maybe that's why most military leaders get this so much better. It's so important to take care of your people. So important because um, it's life and death. That, right. that we we often I think that's where it gets ingrained on a young non-commissioned officer from day one, you know, a young officer. It's it's any of them that are worth their salt, they pick that up right away. Right. Yeah. You still got your people. They're still, you know, you're and I think too in the on the military side of things, we we tend to have maybe a little more intimate experiences with each other, I guess is one way to say it. So you you, you get close to people. You know, and maybe in the civilian world, most jobs, you you don't get that kind of closeness through the struggle that we have through right. field exercises or, or physical training or 
yeah. all those kinds of things. So that team building piece on the the civilian side, I'm sure, is huge. Um, yeah. I mean, I'm sure it makes a huge difference. Yeah, it does. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think that uh, most organizations that are s- aware of where they really are as a group, as an organization, um, w- if they can see that they can get better, they they jump at this sort of stuff, right? And, um, you know, I think it's it's – they don't – a lot of them <laughs> – a lot of them just want to hear war stories. So they go to a, a guy yeah. who's just like, you know, yeah. I mean, maybe a, a Navy SEAL who, who just like, like screaming at people and make them do burpees. Right. That, right. If that's what you want, fine, do that. Right. Um, but it, what I try to do is, is bring in a little bit of, you know, not only what I, what I've learned from experience 40 years, most of that either as a soldier or with soldiers. Um, but what I know about your business, right. What I know about business in general, uh, what I know about, um, you know, profit and loss statements, right? And so um, I could never be an expert in whatever business I'm, I'm looking into and helping people with. But the more I can know about it to make those connections, right, between the things we did in the military and the things we learned in the military and to see what's applicable, right, what fits. Because, you know, not all things do. The after action review does. That fits, Right. But um, having your guys do, you know, 20-mile, 25-mile ruck marches in the dark to a range to, you know, do a live fire might be pretty cool for some of these people to do. They might not make it a mile, you know, but, um, right, right. but it, has nothing, it has nothing to do with them getting their, their work done just by itself, right? Um, if you extract right. from it the, the planning, the preparation, the execution, the team building – those sorts of things, yeah. Now it's now it makes sense, and so if you can do something that helps them see the value of those things, uh, you'll make them better. But yeah. yelling at them, screaming at them, making them do burpees ain't going to do it. Yeah, and I'm glad you said that because uh, you know I think a lot of times that's what some people maybe even want is is what you're talking about with a, a Navy SEAL or a guy coming in. And believe me, I can talk about SEALs all day long, but I'll refrain now. <laughs> Uh, having worked with them but people want to come in it's to me that's entertainment that's not it's more entertainment than it is providing value and i would rather provide you value because we can get up and we can talk war stories all day long we can talk about combat shooting them up but um my most valuable lessons that i took away from the military were were not old in combat a lot of them were right there in garrison you know in the barracks or in training you know, yeah. or even teaching, because I, I had quite a lot of time as an instructor. So, I mean, I, I learned a lot just from being an instructor. And those are the kind of things that I think really for us translate over to the civilian world versus the shoot 'em up stuff. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah. And so another thing I kind of wanted to talk to you about is uh, the officer NCO relationship. So for people who don't understand, in the military, you got your officers and your non-commissioned officers. And your non-commissioned officers are basically enlisted guys that come up through the ranks and they earn a positions of more responsibility positions of leadership and such and um officers come in basically as leaders day one more or less and, and so it's a unique relationship i think in the military or uh, well i can speak to the infantry uh and unit combat units like that um, in the civilian world you know what how do you how do you well, let's just back up for a second. How do you did you view the officer NCO relationship while you were still active? Yeah, I think uh, it's probably one of the greatest things our army does, uh, and I have no idea when it started, right? Um, but I think it's been through a great part of our history is that wherever there's an officer in charge or in command of something, there is a non commissioned or non commissioned officer teamed with him or her, right? That, that leadership in the Army is almost always a team sport, right? It's this, it's this teaming of this, the officer and the NCO. And so the best units are the ones where that relationship is rock solid. Um, there's no daylight between them. I mean, they may have different opinions and ideas, but they never, uh, that never goes beyond a private conversation. Um, and they work well together. Uh, because 
you know, the idea being that, you know, the, the officer is supposed to be more uh, of a generalist, um, kind of seeing the bigger picture, uh, managing that stuff that's up above, right, and protecting everything that's below. And the non-commissioned officer is supposed to be, like, basically managing that stuff that's down below, directing, more, more directly involved um, with the, the units and the soldiers. Um, and so it gives you this ability to kind of look up and down at the same time when, when you know, the platoon leader and the platoon sergeant are working together, or the company commander and first sergeant, battalion commander and battalion command sergeant major, when, when they're working together, right, um, one's kind of looking up and out and the other's kind of looking down and in. And uh, if they've got a shared understanding and if they're, they're of the same mind, it's a beautiful thing. Um, I don't know that there's anything like that in the civilian world. Um, uh, it, probably for a lot of reasons. I mean, just, you know, you yeah. think of the size of the military uh, and the ability to, to do something like that, to resource something like that. Uh, it would be real hard uh, to do in, for most civilian organizations. But uh, to try and capture that, I think, is where you, you look at, you know, how, how does how do people view where they are, right? I mean, because everybody's got something above them that they're answering to and something below them that they're answering for. And so um, if you can, where, the, where those connections happen, right, and they meet up, your relationship with that person ought to be like the relationship between an officer and an NCO who are, who are kind of taking responsibility for the same unit. Um, it's that shared responsibility, shared understanding of, of uh, but it's 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 unique. It's unique to our army for the most part. Um, it doesn't. Most armies don't right. really have a professional non-commissioned officer corps, and and even the ones that have a non-commissioned officer corps, they don't have the same kind of relationship between officers and non-commissioned officers. Uh, so it's 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 a <laughs> it's a pretty unique thing. I mean, there's there's no other way to say it. Uh, but I think the goodness of it is is that idea that you know you've got somebody kind of looking up and out and somebody looking down and in. And together, they're they're working together to kind of make sure that the organization is is uh, getting all the information it needs and putting out all the information that's needed out elsewhere, uh, and that they're they're working together to solve the hard problems. Right. Yeah. No, that's a beautiful description, and and it and it is such a unique and such an important relationship, and and you're absolutely right when that relationship is everything is together and they're of a like mind. I mean, it just makes everything so much better. Leadership can make or break soldiers. I mean, that's, yeah. I mean, obviously kind of pointing out the obvious, I guess, but, you know, I tell people going into the military that all the time, I'm like, Hey, stick it out. If you have a bad leadership experience or whatever, you know, people above you just hang around, it'll get better. But yeah, the uh, turnover is going to happen naturally, you know, every two years, every year, but yeah. 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 And as, so you had, if I remember right, do you have Big Jim for uh, as your SAR major? I wish. No, it, he or Catterton would have been great. No. Um, when we deployed, it was uh, Hoyle Hodges. Okay. And uh, and before that was, um, oh, man. I don't know why I'm forgetting his name. So but, the one you just mentioned, yeah, he and I had – not the best experience together, but uh, it wasn't terrible. I'll say that. My only regret, my greatest regret, but it's probably because it's my only regret, is that uh, uh, he and I had a falling out, uh, and so we weren't that we weren't that unified team. Um, we weren't uh, the well the well connected, well oiled machine. Um, so yeah, and I mean yeah. To me, you're going to have that sometimes. I had, when I was a first sergeant, I had a commander that we were not a well-oiled machine. Uh, and, you know, you just deal with that the best you can. I came into a company in a situation where the commander was not well-liked and there was a very good reason for that opinion. And so I had to mitigate that. And so you're not always going to have it. But again, when it is when it is a good thing, it's, it's very evident. And I will say for, as, so I don't have for you as a battalion commander, when you were my battalion commander, I really don't have a lot of recollection of your time there. And I say that because that's a good thing. <laughs> because look for a 
think from where I was at the time, I would have been a team leader and or squad leader during that time. I was a team leader probably for the beginning and then got elevated to squad leader during your time there. Yeah. So for me, being down where I was and you up where you were, to not have uh, any stories to me is a good thing um, because that meant, for lack of a better way to put it, you stayed out of my way, if that makes sense, if that's okay yeah. to say. <laughs> no, there was a lot of there was a lot of people between you and me and the, and the chain of command. And if I was getting down to their business, it was doing my job right. I mean, right. So thank you. Right. Yeah, I, I appreciate it. Because I've had I've had battalion commanders when I was even lower that I do have stories about that interfered in things and they should not have been down there. So anyway, yeah. uh, I mean that's so the listeners kind of understand that's that's a good thing. Um, well, that was one. So here's the story. You know, that was one of the uh, we, we were at Bagram and and there was a troops in contact kind of thing at one of the the guard posts at, at the airfield, right? And uh, a company was was on the perimeter, and um, you know, Sergeant Major immediately wanted to go down there to the tower where this happened. I was like, time out, <laughs> stop right now between the guys in that tower and you and me, the platoon leader and platoon sergeant, company commander and first sergeant, let's let them sort this out first. And uh, I think he thought I was keeping him from either doing his job or getting that award for valor or something. I'm not sure which one, but uh, yeah, that's, it's like, I mean, it's like that in the small things and in the big things. Right. And, you know, not, prerogative right leaders have the prerogative to go that's where i need to be right and so they go there um but my feeling on it is is that if you jump that far down the chain of command to solve a problem or to see what's going on or to help right uh one of two things is going to happen either a the people throughout the chain of command are going to think that you don't trust them you don't trust them and it's going to create this rift in the relationship right because trust is like the most important thing. And if you, if you violate it or you, you destroy it somehow, it's real hard to get back. The other thing that might happen is, trust be damned, man. They're like, oh, thank God. You know, the battalion commander's coming down to fix this thing. So every time there's a problem, they won't get involved. They'll just wait for you to come fix the problem because that's, that's the modus operandi, right? Is that you know, right. the, the battalion commander's gonna come all the way down here to fix this problem. I don't need to do anything. I'm dropping my rucksack and kicking back and let him deal with all the problems. So, so you, you, you're going you're gonna to either violate people's trust and cause them to feel like you don't trust them, or you're going to give them a pass to take, it, to take the easy button or to, to get lazy, right? And neither of those right. two things is good, right? Uh, right? So you better be, if you jump down there, you better be right that you're the only person who can, who can solve that problem at, right at that time. Uh, that's the way I right. always tried to look at it. Right, and you're not allowing them to grow as a leader and make decisions either. Absolutely. I mean, you're yep. you're you're getting in their business, and I, and I think, uh, I mean, that's a great point. That's a great story because I I think, kind of what that shows is that back then our leadership was not as combat experienced. Is that a fair statement? I think. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Because um, we had not been in combat that long, and I think yeah. hopefully that's a difference now as your leadership has more combat experience, and so it's starting to that, go the other way again. You know, right. I mean, there was that peak in, in the 07 for Iraq and 09, 10 in Afghanistan. Uh, but it's it's going the other way. I, I was just at Fort Benning and a and lot of a lot of captains who are instructors now at the career course that don't have combat patches. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. We started to see that at the, when I was instructing at the Special Warfare Center, we would always ask, you know, how many people um, had been to, to combat, how many people had been deployed and all that. And the number would go down it seemed like about every class uh and kind of a, so kind of a an offshoot funny story about that um we had received some course critiques at one point and we had been teaching patrol base and whatnot and we we had a uh, particular student that disagreed with us teaching patrol bases and their specific comment was that uh patrol bases were irrelevant in a post-vietnam era and this is as a as an instructor, as a chief instructor and first sergeant, this is the only critique that I ever called out. And I never asked who it was or anything, but I had everybody raise their hand. One morning before PT, I went, Okay, everybody who's been deployed, raise your hand. Okay, and you know, a bunch of people raise their hand. I'm like, okay, how many of you 
uh, uh, leave your hand up. Okay. I was like, okay, how many of you stayed in a patrol? And you know, it was the majority of the people that had deployed left their hands up. And I said, okay, so whoever made the comment and I'm not asking who that patrol bases are irrelevant in a post Vietnam era. I need you to look around. End of story. And, yeah. you know, I was, I was like, so, so yeah, I mean, there's, there's, a, it's going the other way. You're absolutely yeah. right. Yeah. But to your point, did I interrupt you? I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, we were, it was a pretty, pretty early on. I, Afghanistan 03 was still pretty early on. I mean, we were, we were making, I, I had to, Bruce Park and I did a change of command ceremony in Afghanistan. Right. John Campbell gave up first brigade in Afghanistan, right? Because there was this idea that, oh, well, we got to, we let the new guys, you know, uh, get their chance to be with the boys in, in combat, you know, because they won't get their chance otherwise. Well, that was, you know, been at this shit for 18 years now, you know, 19 years. Yeah, uh, yeah there are plenty of people have gotten their chance uh, for a lot longer yeah. uh, times, too. So, um, yeah. 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 I, you know, and that was probably, I'm sure that was popular thinking back then, but I don't know. I never looked at that war and thought, yeah, we'll be done here in a year or two. Nope. No, I yeah. mean, I, and, and I'm no, no strategic genius, but, you know, going in uh, at our level, we were like, look, we need to take a 10 year view of this thing that we're going to be here a minimum of 10 years. And we need to focus on 10 year old kids because in 10 years, those 10 year old kids will be 20. And in Afghanistan, places like Afghanistan, Iraq, 20 year old people are probably married and having kids. Right. Right. And so if we can give them a better way and see that, you know, what's the most important thing for them is to have a good, peaceful, safe life for their look, for their kids, we win. But we didn't do that. And so every year it's Groundhog Day, kind of like, you know, it's Groundhog Year. You know, it's like and, and everybody wants to 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 knock down doors and whatever. Um, you got to do that. You know, I mean, that, that's got to happen. Right. But but there's also got to be this focus on. If we're there and we're there for a reason, then let's let's see how we get success. And we never did that, so that was I think we're still not doing it real well. I don't think. Yeah, I, I don't, and and I don't have the answers, but uh, I just, man, that's a tough situation. And yeah, I don't think we've ever done real well with taking a step back and going, all right, how do we really fix this? How do we how do we figure this out? Um, you know, we, we tend to, we tend to take off in an aircraft and fly in it and build it on the way. Right. And, uh, yeah, that, that doesn't always, sometimes you need to land it and work on some stuff and, and then take back off again. And yeah, yeah. I, 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 don't, I don't know if we've done a great job. I, I don't, I'm not real sure. Um, yeah, I try to stay as far away from the Pentagon as I can. You know what I mean? I hear you. I hear you. I had no, no no desire to ever serve there, but you know, um, the Marines do a great job of that, right? They 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 right. make it career enhancing, or they they do a good job of putting uh, key people in those assignments. Where the Army, it's like you got to stay in the field, you know, you got to stay with tactical units, otherwise you don't stand a chance. So, which is where I wanted to be all the time, anyway. Uh, not not uh, yeah yeah yeah. Well, Mike, it's, uh, I'm looking at the clock here. It's 5.05. Uh, I think that's a perfect time right there. Uh, cool. Uh, but so before we get out of here, though, just a couple more things. I want to ask kind of what's in your future. What, what are you looking at next? So I'm, I'm, uh, I'm building the airplane while I'm flying it. <laughs> <laughs> Very I'm nice. Try, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm trying to continue to grow my, my bi uh, business, the leadership development uh, business. I continue to do work for the Army, subject matter expert stuff with uh, research projects, mostly because I find the projects to be interesting, but also the people I'm working with on them are great, great people. I've got uh, three companies, four companies that I work with doing that, uh, and a couple of former retired military guys, uh, former uh, special operators that I was with at the Wexford Group, uh, and they're just good people, and I like working with them. So I, I, I'll continue to do that uh, for the for the time being, I'm working on a second book. Uh, the second book's working title is uh, Be the Fulcrum at Work. And I'm looking at uh, tensions in the workplace, kind of like the tension between everything that's above you in the org chart versus everything that's below you in the org chart. And how do you 
find balance between those two things because it's it's not an either or. It can never be either or. You have to focus on both at the same time. But how do you how much do you give to either? So uh, between the tactic and tactical and the strategic activities that you do, uh, between process and outcomes, uh, between um, uh, you know performance and potential when you're looking at talent management. You know how do you balance these things that are in the uh, in most people's work environments. And so I've done some interviews and I'm in the process of, uh, of turning those into a book right now. And I just want to continue trying to help people. Um, it's been great fun. I really, I've, I've uh, as much as I enjoyed being a soldier, uh, this is nearly as rewarding. Um, I mean, it, it's a different kind of thing, right? And the rewards are different from being a soldier, but uh, I've, I've luckily landed in a place where uh, the people I get to help are, are great and appreciative. And uh, it's just reaffirming for me that I picked the right path in my life. Yeah, gotcha. I love it. Uh, I love it. And I'm glad that you're doing it. Uh, I mean, that's part of my Thanks. goal in this podcast is to bring out to the civilian world more or less more about veterans and specifically in the area of leadership, because I think we've got so much to offer when it comes to leadership, um, those career veterans and whatnot that have spent a long time doing it, you know, somebody yeah. like myself, I'm, I'm 41 years old and, and I basically, yeah, 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 yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. But that being said, I mean, I, I was basically in my first leadership position from the age of 21 or 22 as a yeah. young team leader. That's right. So, I mean, that, that's all a, of your adult life. You lot. spent all your adult life in a leadership position. Really, you know, and so that's that's something that I think is unique to the military. And even if you're not maybe in that first sergeant commander role as an NCO, as an officer, you're still a leader in some capacity. Right. Right. You know, well, we didn't we, we didn't just got talk a, about, a wealth of knowledge. That's right. And we didn't talk about this exactly. But I think one of the other things that um, is unique or at least special about the military is it's more common to find people who understand that leadership in the military, that leadership isn't about the position you hold. It's about your presence, how you show up, how you contribute, right? And so you don't have to be in a leadership position to just to uh, display leadership or leadership attributes, leadership characteristics. And that's what we want. We want people who are leaders, right, who show leadership regardless of the position they're in, in the way they show up, the, the effort they give to it, the way they speak up when they see something that's not going right or that, that you know, somebody's about to make a mistake. Even if that someone is your boss, um, that's where that's where the civilian uh, workforce and the civilian world could really uh, benefit from the experience of people like you, Chad, uh, guys who've spent a lifetime in the military learning these things. Well, great, man. I uh, I love it. And and that's exactly where I was going. So this may seem a little odd to ask this at this point, but I want kind of a, a final question here that I want you to okay. answer. And I'm going to, I'm going to ask this when I talk to people about leadership, I'm going to ask this yeah. quite a bit because I want to hear people's definition. So your definition of leadership. Um, my definition of leadership is, uh, being the person who's willing to do whatever it takes to bring the team forward to accomplish the mission. Um, it's so again that kind of goes back to you don't have to be the person with the title you've got to be the person on the team who's who's willing to just leave it all leave it all behind and and give it your all to to bring the team forward not just to you know not to do it themselves or to just accomplish the mission with leaving everybody behind um ideally that's the person who's in charge and they're they're developing everybody else to kind of come along that way. But for me, leadership is, you know, uh, being that person that's going to do whatever it takes to to get the job done, but take care of the team. You got to take care of the team. Touchdown. <laughs> that's it. You said right, it. Brother. I love it. I love it. Uh, the team. And if the person in charge is not doing it, then you do it. Yep, that's that's right. kind of the way I look at it. And if there's yep. a weak leak in the chain, you make that chain stronger. That's right. So, that's right. yeah, love it. So where can people find you? So um, they can get the book in uh, all the three formats it's available in, Leadership and Balance, Audible, 
um, paperback and Kindle version, all at Amazon.com. Uh, my website is bethefulcrum.com. And uh, I'm on LinkedIn and um, I'm on Facebook uh, and I'm on uh, Instagram, both with my personal accounts, uh, Mike or MP Lorario, and uh, with Be the Fulcrum uh, on Instagram and Be the Fulcrum on Facebook. Uh, Okay, Mike, thanks so much. This has been a great conversation. I've loved it. I could probably talk for another hour. Uh, I love talking about this stuff with you. It's great. Um, but we'll, thanks, Chad. We'll, uh, we'll end it there, and I hope you'll be on again so we can talk some more about all this. It would be my pleasure, and I'm sure uh, we'll do a be- I'll do a better job next time because uh, <laughs> Devin's done something oh, man, once. It was, it was great. It was great. It was awesome. Cool. All right, folks, I'll have all that information in the show notes. And we'll see you next time. If you got anything you're working on, get it done.